Hello, welcome back. Um, we're going to start off, or sorry, please remember this is being shared with permission from Scholastic and will be taken down in the start of June. Uh, we're going to start off with our riddle of the day. The one from last week on Friday was, I am an odd number, take away a letter and I become even. What number am I? The answer is seven. Your riddle of the day for today is, what goes through cities and fields but never moves? I'm going to leave that right there for you guys to think about. And as you're thinking, we're going to get started on our two chapters for today. Just a reminder, we're reading chapters 31 and 32. Chapter 31 is called Pretty Minds. We were doctors, as began cosmetic surgeons, to be precise, Maddie said. We both, we both performed the operation hundreds of times, and when we met, I had just been named the Committee for Morphological Standards. Taddy's, Tally's eyes widened. The Pretty Committee? Maddie smiled with the nickname. We were preparing for a morphological congress. That's when all the cities shared data on the operation. Tally nodded. Cities worked very hard to stay independent of one another, but the Pretty Committee was a global institution that made sure pretties were all more or less the same. It would ruin the whole point of the operation if the people from one city wound up prettier than everyone else. Like most Douglies, Tally had often indulged the fantasy that one day she might be on the committee and help decide what the next generation would look like. In school, of course, they always managed to make it sound really boring, all graphs and averages and measuring people's pupils when they all looked at different faces. At the same time, I was doing some independent research on anesthesia, as said, trying to make the operation safer. Safer? Tally asked. A few people still die each year, as with any surgery, he said, from being unconscious so long more than anything else. Tally bit her lip. She'd never heard that. Oh. I found that there were complications from the anesthetic used in the operation. Tiny lesions in the brain, barely visible, even with the best machines. Tally decided to risk something stupid. What's a lesion? Basically, it's a bunch of cells that don't look right, as said, like a wound or a cancer or something that just doesn't belong there. But you couldn't just but you couldn't just say that, David said. He rolled his eyes towards Tally. Doctors. Maddie ignored her son. When Az showed me his results, I started investigating. The local committee had millions of scans in its database. Not the stuff they put in medical textbooks, but raw data from pretties all over the world. The lesions turned up everywhere. Tally frowned. You mean people were sick? They didn't seem to be, and the lesions weren't cancerous because they didn't spread. Almost everyone had them, and they were always in exactly the same place. She pointed to a spot on the top of her head. A bit to the left ear, as said, dropping a white cube into his tea. Maddie obliged him, then continued. Most importantly, almost everyone all over the world had these lesions. If they were health, health hazard, 99% of the population would show some kind of symptom. But they weren't natural, Tally asked. No, only post-ops. Pretties, I mean, had them. As said, no uglies did. They were definitely a result of the operation. Tally shifted in her chair. The thought of a weird little mystery in everyone's brain made her queasy. Did you find out what caused them? Maddie sighed. In one sense, we did. As and I looked very closely at all the negatives, that is, the few pretties who didn't have the lesions, and tried to figure out why they were different, what made them immune to the lesions. We ruled out blood type, gender, physical size, intelligence factors, genetic markers. Nothing seemed to account for the negatives. They weren't any different from any, everyone else. Until we discovered an odd coincidence, as said. Their jobs, Maddie said. Jobs? Every negative worker in some... Every negative worked in some sort of profession, as said, firefighters, wardens, doctors, politicians, and anyone who worked for special circumstances. Everyone who did those jobs didn't have the lesions. All the other pretties did. So you guys were okay. As nodded, we tested ourselves and we were negative. Otherwise, we wouldn't be sitting here, Maddie said quietly. What do you mean? David spoke up. The lesions aren't an accident, Tally. They're part of the operation, just like all the bone sculpting and skin scraping. It's part of the way being pretty changes you. But you said not everyone has them. Maddie nodded. In some pretties, they disappear, or are intentionally cured, in those whose professions require them to react quickly, like working in an emergency room or putting out a fire. Those who deal with conflict and danger. 
people who face challenges, David said. Hallie let out a slow breath, remembering her trip to the smoke. What about rangers? As nodded. I believe I had a few rangers in my database. All negatives. Hallie remembered the look on the faces of the rangers who had saved her. They had an unfamiliar confidence and surety, like David's, completely different from the new pretties that she and Paris had always made fun of. Paris. Tally swallowed, tasting something more bitter than the tea in the back of her throat. She tried to remember how Paris had acted when she crashed the Garbo Mansion party. She had been so ashamed of her own face. It was hard to remember anything specific about Paris. He looked so different, and if anything, he seemed older and more mature. But in some ways, they hadn't connected. It was as if he had become a different person. Was it only because since his operation they had lived in different worlds? Or had it been something more? She tried to imagine Paris coping out here in the smoke, working with his hands and making his own clothes. The old, ugly Paris would have enjoyed the challenge. But what about pretty Paris? Her head felt light, as if the house were an elevator headed, heading swiftly downward. What do the lesions do, she asked. We don't know exactly, Az said. But we've got some pretty good but we've got some pretty good ideas, David said. Just suspicions, Maddie said. Az looked uncomfortably down at his seat. You were suspicious enough to run away, Tally said. We had no choice, Maddie said. Not long after our discovery, special circumstances paid a visit. They took our data and told us not to look any further or we'd lose our license. It was either run away or forget everything we'd found. And it wasn't something we could forget, As said. Tally turned to David. He sat beside his mother, grim-faced, his cup of tea untouched before him. His parents were still reluctant to say everything they suspected but she could tell that David saw no need for caution. What do you think? she asked him. Well, you know all about how the Rusties lived, right? he said. War and crime and all that. Of course, they were crazy. They almost destroyed the world. And that convinced people to pull the cities back from the wild, to leave nature alone, David recited. And now everybody is happy because everyone looks the same. They're all pretty. No more Rusties, no more war, right? Yeah, in school they said it's all really complicated. But that's the basic, that's basically the story. He smiled grimly. Maybe it's not so complicated. Maybe the reason war and all the other stuff went away is that there's no more controversies, no disagreements, no people demanding change. Just masses of smiling pretties and a few people left to run things. Tally remembered crossing the river to New Pretty Town, watching them have their endless fun. She and Paris used to boast that they'd never wind up so idiotic, so shallow. But when she'd see him, becoming pretty doesn't just change the way you look, she said. No, David said, it changes the way you think. Next chapter, Burning Bridges. They stayed up late into the night, talking with Az and Maddie about their discoveries, their escape into the wild, and the founding, and the founding of the smoke. Finally, Tally had to ask the question that had been on her mind since she'd first seen them. So how did you two change yourselves back? I mean, you are pretty, and now you're... Ugly? As smiled. That part was simple. We're experts in the physical part of the operation. When surgeons sculpt a pretty face, we use a special kind of smart plastic to shape the bones. When we change new pretties till middle or late, we add a trigger chemical to the plastic, and it becomes softer, like clay. Ew, Tally said, imagining her face suddenly softening so she could squish it around into a different shape. With daily doses of this trigger chemical, the plastic will gradually gradually melt away and be absorbed into the body. Your face goes back to where it started, more or less. Tally's eyebrows rose, more or less. We can only approximate the places where the bone was shaved away, and we can't make big changes, like someone's height without surgery. Maddie and I all have the non-cosmetic benefits of the operation. Impervious teeth, perfect vision, disease resistance. But we look pretty close to the way we would have without the operation. As far as... For, Far as the fat that was sucked out, he patted his stomach. That proves to be easy to replace. But why? Why would you want to be ugly? You were doctors, so there was nothing wrong with your brains, right? Our minds are fine, Maddie answered, but we wanted to start a community of people who didn't have the lesions, people who were free of, the, of pretty thinking. It was the only way to see the difference the lesions really made. That meant we had to gather a group of uglies, young people recruited from the cities. Tally nodded. So you had to become ugly, too. Otherwise, who'd trust you? We refined the trigger chemical, created a once-a-day pill. Over a few months, our old faces came back. 
Maddie looked at her husband with a twinkle in her eye. It was a fascinating process, actually. It must have been, Tally said. What about the lesions? Can you create a pill that cures them? They were both silent for a moment. Then Maddie shook her head. We didn't find any answers before special circumstances showed up. As and I are not brain specialists. We wor we've worked on the question for 20 years without success. But here in the smoke, we've seen the difference that staying ugly makes. I've seen it myself, Tally said, thinking of the difference between Paris and David. As raised an eyebrow, you catch on pretty fast, then. But we know there's a cure, David said. How? There has to be, Maddie said. Our data showed that everyone has lesions after their first operation. So when someone winds up in a challenging line of work, the authorities somehow cure them. The lesions are removed secretly, maybe even fixed with a pill like the bone plastic, and the brain returns to normal. There must be a simple cure. You'll find it one day, David said quietly. We don't have the right equipment, Maddie said, sighing. We don't even have a pretty human subject to study. But hang on, Tally said. You used to live in a city full of pretties. When you became doctors, your lesions went away. Didn't you notice that you were changing? Maddie shrugged. Of course we did. We were learning We were learning how the human body works, how to face the huge responsibility of saving lives. But it didn't feel as if our brains were changing. It felt like growing up. Oh, but when you looked around at everyone else, how come you didn't notice that they were brain damaged? Az smiled. We didn't have much to compare our fellow citizens with, only a few colleagues who seemed different from most people, more engaged, but that's hardly a surprise. History would indicate that the majority of people have always been sheep. Before the operation, there were wars and mass hatred and clear cutting. Whenever Whatever these lesions make us, it isn't a far cry from the way humanity was in the rusty era. These days were just a bit easier to manage. Having the lesions is normal now, Maddie said. We're all used to the effects. Tally took a deep breath, remembering Sol and Ellie's visit. Her parents had seemed so sure of themselves, and yet, in a way, so clueless. But they'd always seemed that way, wise and confident, and at the same time disconnected from whatever ugly real-life problems Tally was having. Was that the brain damage? Tally had always thought that that was just how parents were supposed to be. For that matter, shallow and self-centered as how brand new pretties were supposed to it, shallow and self-centered was how brand new pretties were supposed to be. As an ugly, Paris had made fun of them, but he hadn't waited a moment to join in the fun. No one ever did. So how could you tell how much was the operation, and how much was the people going along with the way things had always been? only by making a whole new world, which is just what Maddie and Az had begun to do. Sally wondered which had come first, the operation or the lesions? Was becoming pretty just the bait to get everyone under the knife? Or were the lesions merely a finishing touch on being pretty? Perhaps, perhaps the logical conclusion of everyone looking the same was everyone thinking the same. She'd leaned back in her chair. Her eyes were blurry and her stomach clenched whenever she thought about Paris, her parents, and every other pretty she'd ever met. How different were they, she wondered. How did it feel to be pretty? What was it like behind those big eyes and exquisite features? You look tired, David said. She laughed softly. It seemed like weeks since she and David had arrived here. A few hours of conversation had changed her world. Maybe a little. I guess we'd better go, Mom. Of course, David. It's late, and Tally has a lot to digest. Maddie and Az stood, and David helped Tally up from the chair. She said goodbye to them in a daze flinching inside when she recognized the expression in their old and ugly faces. They felt sorry for her, sad that she'd had to learn the truth, sad that they'd been the ones to tell her. After 20 years, maybe they'd gotten used to the idea, but they still understood that it was a horrible fact to learn. 99% of humanity had something done to their brains, and only a few people in the world knew exactly what. You see why I wanted you to meet my parents? Yeah, I guess I do. Tally and David were in the darkness, climbing the ridge back towards the smoke. The stars, the sky was full of stars now that the moon had set. You might have gone back to the city not knowing. Tally shivered, realizing how close she'd come so many times. In the library, she'd actually opened the pendant, almost holding it to her eye. And if she had, the specials would have arrived within hours. I couldn't stand that, David said. But some uglies must go back, right? Sure, they get bored with camping out and we can't make them stay. You let them go when they don't even know what the operation really means? Tally stopped and took hold of Tally's shoulder, anguish on his face. Neither do we, and if what we told everyone and if what if we told everyone what we suspect? 
Most of them wouldn't believe us, but others would go charging back to the city to rescue their friends. And eventually, the cities would find out what we were saying and would do everything in their power to hunt us down. They already are, Tally said to herself. She wondered how many other spies the specials had blackmailed into looking for the smoke, how many times they'd come close to finding it. She wanted to tell David what they were up to, but how? She couldn't explain that she'd come here as a spy, or David would never trust her again. She sighed. That would be the perfect way to stop herself from coming between him and Shay. You don't look very happy. Tally tried to smile. David had shared his biggest secret with her. She should tell him hers. But she wasn't brave enough to say the words. It's been a long night, that's all. He smiled back. Don't worry, it won't last forever. Tally wondered how long it was until dawn. In a few hours, she'd be eating breakfast alongside Shay and Croy and everyone else she had almost betrayed, almost condemned to the operation. She flinched at the thought. Hey, David said, lifting, his, lifting her chin with his palm. You did great tonight. I think my parents were impressed. Huh? With me? Of course, Tally, you understood immediately what all this means. Most people can't believe it at first. They say the authorities would never be so cruel. She smiled grimly. Don't worry, I believe it. Exactly. I've seen a lot of city kids come through here. You're different from the rest of them. You can see the world clearly, even if you did grow up spoiled. That's why I had to tell you. That's why Tally looked into his eyes and saw that his face was glowing again, touching her in that pretty way she felt before. That's why you're beautiful, Tally. The words made her dizzy for a moment, like she was falling, like the falling feeling of looking into a new pretty's eyes. Me? Yes. She laughed, shaking her head clear. What, with my thin lips and my eyes too close together? Tally. And my frizzy hair and my squashed down nose? Don't say that. His fingers brushed her cheeks where the scratches were almost healed and ran fleetingly across her lips. She knew how calloused his fingertips were, as hard and rough as wood, but somehow their caress felt soft and tentative. That's the worst thing they do to you, to any of you. Whenever, whatever those brain lesions are all about, the worst damage is done before they even pick up the knife. You're all brainwashed into believing you're ugly. We are. Everyone is. So you think I'm ugly? She looked away. It's a pointless question. It's not about individuals. Yes, it is, Tally. Absolutely. I mean, no one can really be... You see, biologically, there are certain things that we all... The words choked off. You really think I'm beautiful? Yes. More beautiful than Shay? They both stood silent, their mouths gaping. The question had popped out of Tally before she could think. How could she have uttered something so horrible? I'm sorry. David shrugged and turned away. It's a fair question. Yes, I do. Do what? I think you're more beautiful than Shay. He said it so matter-of-factly, as if talking about the weather. Tally's eyes closed, every bit exhausted, every bit of exhaustion from the long day crashing into her at once. She saw Shay's face. Too thin, eyes too far apart, and an awful feeling welled up inside her. The warmth she'd felt from David was crushed by it. Every day of her life, she'd insulted other uglies and had been insulted in return. Fatty, pig eyes, bony, zits, freak. All the names uglies called one another, eagerly and without reserve. But equally without expectation, so that no one felt shut out by some irrelevant mischance of birth. And no one was considered to be even remotely beautiful privileged because of a random twist in their genes. That's why they'd made everyone pretty in the first place. This was not fair. Don't say that, please. You asked me. She opened her eyes. But it's horrible. It's wrong. Listen, Tally, that's not what's important to me. What's inside of you matters a lot more. But first, you see my face. You react to symmetry, skin tone, and the shape of my eyes. And you decide what's inside of me based on all your reactions. You're programmed to. I'm not programmed. I didn't grow up in a city. It's not just culture, it's evolution. He shrugged in defeat, the anger draining from his voice. Maybe some of it is, he chuckled tiredly. But you know what first got me interested in you? Tally took a deep breath, trying to calm herself. What? The scratches on your face. She blinked. The what? These scratches. He softly touched her cheek again. She shook away the electric feeling from his, that his fingers left behind. That's nuts. Imperfect skin is a sign of a poor immune system. David laughed. It was a sign that you had been in an adventure, Tally, and that you'd bashed your way across the wild to get here. To me, it was a sign that you had a good story to tell. 
Her outrage faded. A good story. Callie shook her head, a laugh building inside of her. Actually, my face got scratched up back in the city, hoverboarding through some trees at high speed. Some adventure, huh? It does tell a story, though. As I thought the first time I saw you, you take risks. His fingers wound into a, a lock of her singed hair. You're still taking risks. I guess so. Standing here in the darkness with David felt like a risk, like everything was about to change again. He still had the look in his eyes, the pretty look. Maybe he really could see past her ugly face. Maybe what was inside her did matter more to him than anything else. Tally stepped onto a fist-sized stone on the path and found an uneasy balance on it. They were eye to eye now. She swallowed. You really think I'm beautiful? Yes. What you do, the way you think, makes you beautiful. A strange thought crossed her mind, and Tally said, I'd hate it if you got the operation. She couldn't believe she was saying it. Even if they didn't do your didn't do your brain, I mean. Gee, thanks. His smile shone in the darkness. I don't want you to look like everyone else. I thought that was the point of being pretty. I did too. She touched his eyebrow where the line of white cut through it. So how'd you get that scar? An adventure. A good, a good story. I'll tell you sometime. You promise? I promise. Good. She leaned forward, her weight pressing into him, and as her feet gradually slipped down the stone, their lips met. His arms wrapped around her and pulled her closer. His body was warm in the pre-dawn cold and formed something solid and certain in Tally's shaken reality. She held on so tightly, amazed at how intense the kiss had become. A moment later, she pulled away to take a breath, thinking for just a second how odd this was. Uglies did kiss each other, but it always felt like nothing counted until you were pretty. But this counted. She pulled David towards her again, her fingers digging into the leather of his jacket. The cold, her aching muscles, and the awful things she had just learned. All of it made this feeling stronger. Then one of her, his hands touched the back of her neck, traced the slender chain there, down to the cold, hard metal of the pendant. He stiffened, and their lips parted. What about this, he said. She enclosed the metal heart in her fist, the other arm still wrapped around him. There was no way she could tell David about Dr. Cable now. He would pull away, maybe forever. The pendant was still between them. Suddenly, Callie knew what to do. It was perfect. Come with me. Where? To the smoke. I have to show you something. She pulled him up the slope, scrambling until they reached the top of the ridge. Are you okay? He asked, panting. I didn't mean to. I'm great. She smiled broadly at him, then peered down on the smoke. A single campfire burned through the center of town, where the night watch gathered to warm up every hour or so. Come on. Suddenly, it seemed so important to get there fast, before her certainty faded, before the warm feeling inside her could give way to doubt. She scrambled down between the painted stones of the hoverboard path, David struggling to keep up. When her feet reached level ground, she ran, heedless of the dark and the silent huts on either side, seeing only the firelight ahead. Her speed was effortless, like hoverboarding on an open straightaway. Callie ran until she reached the fire, skidding to a halt against its cushion of heat and smoke. She reached up to unclasp the pendant's chain. Tally? David ran up, panting, confusion on his face. He tried breathlessly to say more. No, she said. Just watch. The pendant swung by its chain in her fist, sparkling red in the firelight. Tally focused all of her doubts on it, all her fear of discovery, her terror at Dr. Cable's threats. She clutched the pendant, squeezing the unyielding metal until her muscles ached as if forcing into her own mind the almost unthinkable fact that she might really remain an ugly for life, but somehow not ugly at all. She opened her hand and threw the necklace into the center of the fire. It landed on a crackling log, the metal heart burning black for a moment, then gradually turning yellow and white in the heat. Finally, a small pop came from it, as if something trapped inside had exploded, and it slid from the log and disappeared among the flames. She turned to David. Her vision was spotted with sinuous shapes from staring into the fire. He coughed at the smoke. Wow, that was dramatic. Tally suddenly felt foolish. Yeah, I, I guess so. He moved closer. You really meant that? Whoever gave it to you doesn't matter anymore. What if they come? No one's coming. I'm sure of it. David smiled and gathered Tally into a hug, pulling her away from the edge of the fire. Well, Tally Youngblood, you certainly know how to make a point. You know, I would have believed you if you just told me, no, I had to do it like this. I had to burn it, to know for sure. He kissed her forehead and laughed. You're beautiful. When you say that, I almost, she whispered, 
Suddenly, a wave of exhaustion struck Tally, as if her last bit of energy had gone into the fire with the pendant. With the pendant. He was tired from the wild run here, from the night with Maddie and Az, and from the hard day's work, and tomorrow she would have to face Shay again, and explained what had happened between her and David. Of course, the moment Shay saw that the pendant was gone from around Tally's neck, she would know, but at least she'd never know the real truth. The pendant was charred beyond recognition, its true purpose hidden forever. Tally slumped in David's arms, closing her eyes. The image of the glowing heart was burned into her vision. She was free. Dr. Cable would never come here now, and no one could ever take her away from David or the smoke or do to Tally's brain what the operation did to Pretty. She was no longer an infiltrator. She finally belonged here. Tally found herself crying. David silently walked her to the bunkhouse. At the door, he leaned forward to kiss her, but she pulled away and shook her head. Shay was just inside. Tally would have to talk to her tomorrow. It wouldn't be easy, but Tally knew she could face anything now. David nodded kissed her finger, kissed his finger, and traced one of the remaining scratches on his cheek, the, on her cheek. See you tomorrow, he whispered. Where are you going? For a walk. I need to think. Don't you ever sleep? Not tonight, he smiled. Tally kissed his hand and slipped inside, where she kicked off her shoes and crawled into bed with her clothes on, falling asleep in seconds, as if the weight of the world had lifted from her shoulders. The next morning, she awoke to chaos the sounds of running and shouting and the screaming machines invading her dreams. Out of the bunkhouse window, the sky was full of hover cars. Special circumstances had arrived. And that is not only the end of our two chapters for today, but it's also the end of part two. Tomorrow we'll be starting part three, Into the Fire. Thank you and have a great day.